Okay, welcome back to another episode of Anything Goes. I have been very excited since yesterday. We have become aware of this amazing individual a couple of weeks ago, admittedly, Jose, when you incredibly, I said yesterday in the email, I respected your hustle. You actually reached out to us, which we loved so much and finally got a space in our days to actually watch your speaker reel and watch who you are and what you've achieved. And we were just like, we need this guy on the show. And it's all happened that the stars aligned and we get you today. So you will have just heard his incredible introduction, but uh, yeah, we're so excited to have you. Now, I will say, we didn't tell you this, we never tell our guests. We actually have five fast questions that we ask and Morgs was like, well, they might, they don't have to be fast. We, we are, we just, they're just five simple questions. You don't have to answer them fast. But, but um, five fast. So <laughs> take your time, like have fun with this. And it's a really beautiful chance to obviously for us to get to know you, for the guests, to, the listeners to get to know you. Um, and it's, it's amazing some of the stuff that comes up that we can always circle back to. So yeah, I'm excited because just so people know as well, we, we didn't really, we talked for about 30 seconds off air before we started recording. So um, all this we're learning with you guys too. So you want to find the first one away? Let's go. All right. Okay. Jose, name one guest you'd have at your dinner party and why? I would have the, I think it was King George IV uh, from, the, I, yeah. from the King's speech. Yeah, I think it was uh, George, I think he's George VI. And it's funny because we just watched King's speech. We literally did. For the first time about two weeks ago. Yeah. As you, as you can imagine, I, I could really relate to his challenges in the movie, the, the challenges of being a king. Yeah, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can all relate to that, I'm sure. Complete relatability. <laughs> Perfect. Okay, so um, the next one, um, Jose, is um, your favorite food. What do you, what's your, your, your main go-to? What do you love to eat? Even though, even though Japanese food is probably my my answer, I have to say, I have to say that no type of food has has the same emotional effect as. Breakfast food and coffee, those things are <laughs> are just heaven. Like bacon, eggs, toast, that sort of and stuff. I, for me, it, it has to contain avocado. That's <gasps> that's a that's must. Preach. I did see in your video you put sliced avocado on your pizza. <laughs> Disgusting. You know, people. Day. People give Australians a hard time because we put pineapple on our pizza and apparently that's sacrilegious as well. Yeah. So, yeah, so I do both. <laughs> I, I, I have mine literally with both pineapple and then just to make it more controversial, yeah. I, uh, I add the uh, avo. Yeah. Well, you'd get, you would love it down here in Australia. We put avocado on a lot of things, but we yeah, veg nice. everything. Too. everything. Amazing. Nice. Okay, so what is the best piece piece of advice that you have ever been given? I I could obviously answer this in so many ways, but the first thing that comes to mind is I remember I was at an elect electronic music event in Montreal and I was just having a conversation with, with some guy there. And at the time I was not confident or 
open about the fact that I had a stutter, I would just avoid speaking. And then I, I shared a bit of that with him. And he said, we all just, we all just have to be ourselves. Mm. And now it's a super cliche quote that we've all heard a billion times. And to be honest, I, it's not that this quote had a huge impact, but it's that it's a quote that really encapsulates the journey that I've been on that I'm sure we'll, we'll to talk about uh, in a few minutes. Yeah. Awesome. Um, and I think what was that was the fourth one, I believe. So the fifth one, sorry, I just had them. Um, well, I think I know what the answer to this one already is, but I'm going to let you talk about it. If, if you could have any superpower, what would it be? See, now I'm intrigued. What? Yeah, same. What was your... I think, because I, I, I watched your TED talk, and again, I don't, we could we'll probably have to come back to this, but um, I think your superpower is actually... Uh, owning who you are and and being confident in that and then going out and sharing that with the world, that message that you give to people. But again, I don't want to get too much into that now because I think we're going to talk a bit more about that further down. Um, but I'd be interested to know what you think as well. Yeah. So is the question, what is my superpower or yeah. what's the one I w- want to have? Or Yeah. What would you want to have? Okay. Be because I expect us to to get into this other stuff a bit later, I'll I'll say I'll say I'll say something else now. I mean, I believe I'm I'm just gonna go with with the ability to 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 teleport and to just go from one place to uh, another instantly. I've done a lot of traveling and it, it's something that I, and I'm sure that the whole world misses right now. Mm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, I, I think you're the first person who said teleportation. I think yeah. I said invulnerability because I like Wolverine and I'm hairy like him. So <laughs> I went in vulnerability. Uh, and there's one more. I think there's one more question, wasn't there? Um, what did you want to be when you grew up? I, and based on the the past tense, I'm assuming you meant when I was way younger. When you were yeah. little, what did you want to be? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, ironically, I wanted to engineer a life that has that had no speaking or as little speaking as possible so that so that was my goal yeah wow and i think that is just this life has a funny way on these episodes of just being i don't know getting to a point where exactly we want to start and i really would love to start there jose because I know that we've, we, Morgs and I have looked at, consumed anything and everything that we could of yours over the past kind of 24 hours, just completely inspired and, you know, obsessed with learning about you essentially. And I read somewhere or heard you say on one of the videos that you almost, or you didn't speak for almost two decades. Is that right? So I, I, only spoke when I absolutely had to, but I I actively tried to avoid all speaking situations. I did have a few where I would be able to 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 speak a bit more and not care as much. Maybe with a handful of friends or i w- i would have wanted to say family but to be honest 
I can think of numerous occasions when I, there's one that comes to mind. It was a family reunion. I, I was 19 and I was just so fearful and anxious about having to go and to be asked questions and then start to stutter and just feel so small because that's how I used to interpret it. I, a few days before that, I took a shower and I then stood outside at night for half an hour hoping to get sick so that I could stay home and have a and 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 have an excuse to share with to to give my parents for why I should be staying at home. So that's that's basically one example of of how I used to uh, analyze social situ- situations. Wow. Wow. You know, it's, it's, it's so interesting as well, Joe. So it's like we, we, social anxiety is, is such a big thing. I know, I think we've all had moments where we think like, oh, you know, in, we don't want to front up to a certain situation or um, you want to get out of it. So you try and self-sabotage. I mean, I've had situations where I've prayed for a car crash on the way to somewhere I didn't want to go to. You know, not, not a bad one, just one to get me out of going, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, not too bad. No broken bones. No broken bones, but enough <laughs> to feel, yeah. oh, look, I can't go now as well. So Jose, yeah. Jose from wow. that yeah. point of being outside, you know, trying to be, trying to make yourself sick. So you actually had a legitimate situation to tell your parents, like, I can't go. And to family as well. You know, I know that we all, I mean, family can be the worst, but I just think that wasn't even, you know, a public speaking event. How did you go from that Jose to Jose who gets up and is a stand-up comedian and fronts up to this TEDx talk and, you know, is basically taking the world by storm? What, what, I mean, that's probably a 45 minute conversation just there, but (laughs) what was the catalyst? What was the, the one main thing to be like enough? I need to use my voice. You, you said it's a uh, 45 inch right there, most likely 60 w- with me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. I think there is, there are two ways of, of looking at change. And some people think of it as one major tipping point that leads to a transformation. Uh, I often think think about my journey as as millions of of micro moments of courage mm. where I did something I I chose discomfort instead of comfort and it it really to to focus on public speaking specifically, which you had just mentioned now, when I was in my, in my second year of university, I would, I would schedule this, these meetings with all, all, with all of my professors to ask them to, Ex- 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 exempt me from all of my p- presentations and I would sometimes ask them to do extra homework to to not have to even participate mm. in the class because some classes especially in in business school had some marks for actually asking questions or or sharing in class so i i was committed to to doing anything i could to never have to show the world that i am different that Mm -hmm. i am someone who who 
stutters. So how did the change happen? A few steps. One, I learned this breathing technique to control my stutter, which was one first step. But even after I had, I had learned this technique in the UK on a speech therapy course, it still took me years to, as one of you had said, to, to find my voice. Mm. Because even though I had the tools to speak more fluently, I, I had to overcome the, the psychological barrier of having to face people and having to and having to withstand the reactions of the world, which are often not there are some great people in the world. Some people will react to me or to the stutter in a less in a in a in a less positive manner and those reactions were i think the source of so much of my fear mm. it wasn't all in my head these so these were real reactions that had happened and that convinced me that hey i i am better off not speaking at all why would i want to put myself through this but then of course in reality the only way to live is to ex is to experience discomfort right mm -hmm. yeah absolutely you know it's interesting as well because one of the things that we often talk about is is um, life outside of your comfort zone and and when we examine that you know that's where all the fun stuff happens it's where the best stuff is right outside of your comfort zone and you're a great example of that because as people learn more about their story, they're going to find out that the moment that you chose to step out of your comfort zone, that's when things really started to change for you. So I want to ask you as well, there's a great clip on your Instagram, um, but that obviously just goes into a bit about um, as part of your therapy, you had to go out and have a hundred conversations um, just with strangers and introduce yourself. Can you tell, can you talk us a bit through that? And like, obviously what was, you know, what was going through your mind um, in the lead up to it, the, like the morning of, like how are you feeling? Uh, and what was it like, you know, just the very first person that you went up to? Yeah, so, so this exer exercise, I initially learned on, on the speech therapy program that I had done. And it's, it is an exercise that changed my life. And when I said, when I, when I said millions of micro moments of courage, this exercise comes to mind because over the past few years, it wasn't just one session of a hundred people. I must have talked to tens of thousands of people all around the city and it's an exercise that literally re, 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 rewired my brain and how I deal with fear and discomfort. Because when I would say, I would go up to a group of people to ask them for directions. In some cases, when I would get stuck, people would start laughing, especially if they were younger. Mm -hmm. But then I realized that I should be reverse engineering this and proactively choosing groups of people who, who look like they might give me a harder time because that's where a lot of the, of, of the growth actually happened. It wasn't just me talking to the super nice 85 year old <laughs> grandmother that was going to actually cause change. 
it was almost me having to relive some of my childhood and teenage memories by by exposing myself to some of the to some of the to some of the some of the demographics that perhaps I would associate with negative experiences in schools or whatever. So it 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 is a very uncomfortable exercise, but it's it's possibly one of the essential pillars of my journey without which I would not have been able to start tackling stand-up and public speaking. And one last thing I'll add about this exercise is uh, before the, 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 the pandemic, when I would do a lot of, of talks at conferences or performances at comedy clubs, my go-to warm-up before almost every talk or speech uh, to talk or, or, or performance, even when I'd be in, a, in another city, I'd make it a point to go to the mall or to go to the streets to talk to 50 to 100 strangers. And before my TEDx talk, a few days before the, the talk, I was so, uh, I was so anxious about it. This was in front of 500 people, which at the time was my, which at the time was my largest audience by far. I've since done talks in front of 3,000 people, but at the time, the anxiety was so strong, and I and I knew I had to go do the exercise, but it it was not working. I was not. I was really struggling so much more than usual, both physically and mentally with the stutter and with reactions. And at some point after getting a few negative reactions, I went to the corner and I, I, I almost had tears and I was like, man, just go home. Like, just go home, watch Netflix. Why are you doing this to yourself? But then I knew deep down that no, stay here until it's fixed. And then, and I, and that day I stayed at the mall for seven hours, oh. talked to 200 people until it felt like I was once again in control of it. Yeah. Yeah. Jose, this is what gets us. Like this morning at the gym, we're both on the treadmill watching your TEDx talk. And it was, I think, an 18 minute talk. And it probably took us 35 minutes because we just kept pausing and hitting the other and, and talking. And we said, you know, 98% wow. of society, you know, who can, who have a voice, like who speak fluently won't even would never go up to a stranger in a mall or in the street and ask for direction because they're so frozen in fear of what people will think of them and you say something in that TED talk that just really hit me like one of probably the moments that when I'm talking on stages in years to come will quote you but it was how you said you know everybody has a stutter mm. I want, and can you, I want you to say this because this really impacted me and everyone's going to go and watch your TEDx talk now, but mm -hmm. I would love for you to say, because my thing was, I, you know, Morgs even said it, he's like, people wouldn't even go do this, you know, no one would do this. And here's this guy who, you know, is like frozen in fear, but doing it anyway to try and get out of being frozen in fear. 
So speak about this notion of, because I want people that are stuck right now, because I think that's 98% of the population, they're so scared of what other people will think of them that they're not speaking up or asking for the pay rise or, you know, asking for the date or writing the book or pressing post on a, you know, publish on a post or whatever. Um, so I want you to give that beautiful voice to the everyone's got to stutter. Yeah, uh, it's, it's so awesome, by the way, that you guys were watching my, my, my TED talk from on the treadmill. It's such a funny image <laughs> that I have in my mind. <laughs> it's probably as weird as it sounds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I would say it, it especially, it especially became clear to me after I had done a few of my talks and that's before my TEDx talk. After I did my first talk, which is the talk that eventually won me the award of inspirational speaker of of the year and that's that's the talk that was featured on goldcast with a few million views and, and and that was my first talk on a stage stage so i had done some public speaking at toastmasters which which was one of the big steps i took on my journey of overcoming fears. So I, I had noticed after that first talk that a lot of people would, would come up to me or would reach out to me on the socials and would share their own obstacle and how they could relate. And I would hear things like, I was a, I was a dancer and then I started feeling self-conscious about my body so I stopped and then I I heard your talk and it inspired me to to get on stage again or this one person this is one of the most memorable messages I've ever received he reached out to me said he he had been struggling with substance abuse and something about what i said about fear and and my uh, and my journey inspired him to to make changes and to become a better father and husband and I realized that this is not about stuttering. This, this is more so about the, 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 about the, the metaphor of stuttering, i.e. the act of holding back, the act of not doing the thing that we want to do because of a fear that can be so strong and paralyzing that it, it ends up robbing us from our own, our own potential. Yes, sorry, I was like, I'm muting myself because you're just amazing. And Jose, there's a quote that I, I love to speak. I love speaking on stages as well. And my problem is that I talk too much. I talk. Yes, this is also fast. a huge problem. I talk too <laughs> fast. I talk too much. I, I interrupt myself. And I, <laughs> like, so I interrupt myself all the time, like with like a new sentence. And I said to Morgs this morning, I said, you know, it's funny for me watching Jose's speeches. I probably, I'm like, I actually found it, I was like, cathartic is the wrong word. And I don't, I'll, I'll find the word, but I said, 
to take a pause because it does take a little bit longer, you have to become quite present. Mm. And it was a gift to really just become present and watch the videos you've put out. And I'd love to come. We'll, we want to come to Canada and we'll come and watch. Um, we love stand-up comedy, so we'll come and watch some of your comedy. We're going to talk about a little bit. I hope we can talk. We've got time to talk yeah, about comedy. Yeah, we've got time. We've got a lot Yeah, great. Okay, awesome. But what I wanted to say was um, <laughs> one of my favourite quotes from about speaking is from a gentleman named Sir Ralph Richardson who says, the most precious uh, the most precious things in the speech are the pauses. So mm. to me, you're like, I'm like, I, I am learning so much from you just from even a speaking perspective where I think the art of how you have to, you know, with the breathing technique and it does take a little bit longer. I felt even the energy of that TEDx day, that was the big one that I saw. It's a gift that you give people to become really present so yeah, I just wanted to say that. And also oh. as well, uh, Jose, it's just one of the things you mentioned also as well, which, which there's, you know, there's a, there's a few things that stuck out for me. Um, but one of the things that really caught my attention was when you talked about joining the debate club mm. and, and you said something um, that I think is really, really important. And it was that joining the debate club taught you, it's not how fast you talk, mm. but it's actually what you say and how you use your words. Uh, and that's, I think what Anna was saying before was, when, when we were listening to your TED talk and a couple of your other bits are on, on Instagram and things like that, um, was that how, how careful you are, not careful, but how you select um, the words that you're using. And that's what I think what Anna was trying to say is that your way of communicating may be a little bit slower, but it's very effective. It's the, I think it was a uh, comedian who had, who had used this ex this ex this expression when referring to my stand up he said something along the lines of the economy of words yeah and i sense that because i cannot afford to ramble i must <laughs> i just pointed to myself <laughs> It's yeah, I must aim for 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 linguistic precision. Yeah. And in a way it does it does lead to to thinking more about what is the optimal way to express this. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's also awesome. I love it. I think it's great, man. I yeah. think um it definitely, you know, the thing is, it helped, it helped my attention. I was engaged. I was wanting more. Um, so I, I, it's definitely taught me a lot as well because, I mean, I can be a bit of a rambler. I think we all, all can sometimes. Um, but just, yeah, I, I really got so much out of it. And Anna will tell you as well, I'm, I'm not an emotional person. Um, I rarely, really cry. I was watching. Um, Twice, I think in your, the 15. Yeah, I was watching your Instagram video while I was on the treadmill as well. And I started to tear up and I was like, I'm in the middle. It's a busy gym too. And I'm like, I can't start fucking crying on the treadmill. <laughs> at peak, peak time in the morning. So, um, but I just wanted to thank you for that, for that. Um, the way you show up as well, because if it impacts me emotionally, it's, it's you know, it's, it's obviously reaching a lot of people and, um, and affecting them too. And I think one of the things I said to Anna was that, we do a lot of work with people who work in sales and marketing and obviously with anything like that, there's a bit of cold calling and, and people had these, um, they're, you know, in the sense they're able uh, to talk um, with, without a stutter, um, but they hold back as well. And this off, and they're, they're holding back in their speech and the way they communicate, which is then holding them, them back in their lives. Um, and I think you, what you represent and, um, what you bring is such a great example of someone who, when they embrace their fear and step outside of their comfort zone, um, the whole world starts to open up and you speak on stages, you become this person that people look to for inspiration, and motivation. Um, and it's definitely impacted me. But what I, what, how did you make this jump from um, having, um, you know, a starter uh, and, uh, you know, not wanting to speak to then jumping straight into stand-up comedy or maybe it wasn't straight mm. into stand-up comedy but why stand-up comedy yeah because that's a big like we yeah. love love, love it comedy. nice so like, <laughs> that's savage 
Bravo. Yeah. <laughs> Before I get into into that, it's it's interesting you mentioned sales, Morgan. Yeah. Because quite often I at conferences, salespeople come up to me and say that they got a lot out of it from mm. uh, overcoming the fear of rejection, mm. especially when it comes to the exercise I, I would do on, on the streets. So that, that, is, that is definitely one of the angles that some of my keynotes have had yeah. because it's a, it's a very readable challenge. Yeah. In terms of why stand up, I'm of the belief that if you are if you are dealing with a problem that seems that seems radical, the solution has to be radical as well. It felt as though I could not aim for the middle. I had to choose between staying where I was controlled by fear or doing something so out there on the other end of the spectrum that it would indirectly make everything else in my life a lot more accessible. Yeah. So, but in terms of why the stand up specifically, I think there, there is a, a deeper reason. And that's because through humor, we can address the things that we struggle with the most in a way that allows us to, to make peace with them while allowing other people to to be to connect with us i had felt extremely isolated most of my life and i know it's it is quite ironic that after <laughs> after years of avoiding people this year the 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 government told me i was right the first time <laughs> it's like no the the whole thing with the comedy and the ted talk that was not right no <laughs> yeah but you need to go back to isolation yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but we saw yeah i saw you just did a you did a what's it called what, what a, socially distanced stand up comedy night last night on a rooftop yeah how did that go it it went amazingly well and i really i had done a decent amount of, of virtual comedy performances and talks in the last few months but this was the first in person one since march and it really reminded me of, of why I love performing and why I love comedy to go back to this whole, to this whole concept of th through humor, I was able to change, to reframe my story and to, to take stuttering from something that was a source of insecurity to something that I can joke about with confidence. It, it completely liberated my, it completely liberated myself in a way. And, and it's, and it's, it's, it is, it's, it's, it, it's, it's, uh, uh, and it's not that it was just the first time that had this impact. It's 
every time that I do stand up, it has this, this impact on me. Mm. You know, it's, it's, um, it's interesting as well, because you've, re- you reminded me of a, a stand up comedian uh, who was Australian stand up comedian. He was very big in the eighties and nineties. I'm not sure if he's around anymore, but um, his name was Steady Eddie and he had cerebral palsy, um, which affected his speech and his ability to move. But he was hilarious. Very, very funny. I'll have to look him up because I don't know what happened to him. But again, it's so interesting. And um, I think sometimes when when people like yourself are able to um, take something that people might perceive as a weakness and turn it into their strength, like you've done with stand-up comedy, it inspires other people to, and even people like myself, that's included as well. I've got to refocus and look internally at like, what am I doing? right now what can i be doing better what's holding me back what am i not speaking up about um and that's um i think when we talked a little bit about superpowers at the beginning um when i think of you that's really what i think about as being one of one of your superpowers at least anyway absolutely and jose here's what i want the the listeners to focus in on now You, like I said, you have just obviously from two decades of not speaking to becoming this, you know, keynote speaker, stand-up comedian, putting yourself out there, having conversations with 200 strangers in a day from crying in the, you know, wanting to give up. I want you to speak directly now to the listener who is in their home or in their car or in the shower. I listen to my podcast in the shower and holding themselves back on a dream or a hope or a, writing a book or asking someone out on a date because they're so stuck in their own fear. Mm. What would be the number one piece of advice that you could give to them right now? Now, I have a story. Do, do, we, do we have time for that? Absolutely. Yeah, well, look, we're, we don't have we don't have a time limit or no. anything. So um, you just go for as long as you feel like. So I think this story will will set up the three the three things that I would encourage everyone to do. So when I was 13 years old, I went to Austria with my parents and my sister on, uh, on a vacation. And we were in Vienna for three days on day one I see this girl with red hair (laughs) which I know is is uh is is quite the quite the coincidence (laughs) yeah who's this fake (laughs) that doesn't count (laughs) (laughs) so i see this i see this girl with i see this girl with red hair and i think she and and my younger self thinks she she looks adorable but then a few a few a few seconds later she she gets into a taxi with her mother and they leave. On day two, I am at the, at the Museum of Music in Vienna with my family and there she was, cute and cultured. My 13 year old self had excellent taste. Yes. <laughs> so, in that moment, I think about saying hello to her because two consecutive days in a big city is a crazy coincidence. But as 
as I am, as I am drowning in my own head, she once again vanishes. Day three, the 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 last day in in, in Vienna. I'm I'm having lunch on 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 this patio with my parents, my sister, and this couple that we had met at the hotel. And my dad proceeds to to tell uh, to to tell them all about the girl with the red hair. And I, of course, as a shy as a shy thirteen year old, I felt really eh, embarrassed in that moment, and I just look away, right? And with incomprehensible statistical absurdity, I see her. And everyone at the t- table starts ch- ch- cheering for me. Oh, God. Third, uh, third day in a row, they said, you have to speak to her. But I... St- I still remember so well how I felt in that moment. I felt absolutely paralyzed by one single thought. But what would she even say when she hears me stutter? And that was what my world revolved around. And if, if I could go back in time and speak to, speak to that 13-year-old, I would tell him, one, it's okay to be different. Mm. Own what makes you, you unique. It took me so, so, so long to, to, to just accept this. And, and that's why the, the, the be yourself quote from earlier is very relevant here. The se- second thing is to use fear as a compass. When something elicits this response, chances are we have to do it. And now when I, a few months ago, I was at a conference just as a guest. And at the end, they announced the q and it, it was Mark Manson, the, the author of the subtle art of not giving an F. Yeah. 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 So when he announced the Q and A, I felt the fear. E- even though at that time I had all, all, already done the stand up and the TED talk, I felt the fear. And how I reacted was, uh oh. I'm feeling fear. I have to do this. And I, <laughs> I put my hand up and I, and that's, I think, uh, that's a very important distinction because fear and action can coexist. Mm. We don't have to wait for fear to magically disappear before we do the things that we know we want to do. So two is fear acts as a compass and fear and an action co- can coexist. And lastly, once you find that thing that scares you the most, do it, but then do it again, again, again. It's not a one-time thing. I have felt fear before every speaking engagement, every, and every, 
in every stand-up performance. In fact, before some of the really big performances, I have thought to myself, what are you doing, man? Like, there are 3,000 people out there, but it's, we, it has to become a lifestyle. It has to, to become a way of life wherein we just associate fear with yes instead, instead of fear with no. I'm sitting, I'm a very emotional person, don't I? <laughs> she is. <laughs> I just, I just think out of anyone I've ever had the privilege of knowing, and we know a lot of amazing individuals, this message is life changing because I just truly working and coaching with women specifically myself all day, every day, I'm like, they hold back in every single way of in their life, in their relationships, in their health, in their sex lives, in, in all ways, in their jobs, in, in their travel, in their friendships because of this fear. And I just think those three pieces of advice, if people really took them on and implemented them, they, it would and it will fundamentally change their life. And I know I'm looking at morgues now, I'm like, we are going to have a chat after this and decide <laughs> what where our next fear compass needs to lead us for sure because that was just amazing and if i can add it's it's interesting you you brought up that you work with women i i have done a few keynotes at at women leadership events uh and i have found that the 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 message of s- s- speaking up in spite of discomfort is one that has deeply resonated with women mm-hmm. and i think there are a lot of uh, parallels between finding your voice as someone who stutters or finding your voice as someone who has held back due to due to societal reasons yeah yeah well i think um we're coming up on an hour so i think just to just to take us just to take us out i think um what's next for you yeah where from here where to from here i (laughs) yes uh (laughs) that's that that has been on my mind that that has been on my mind lately especially since at the moment i'm doing i'm doing most of my or yeah uh i'm doing most of my keynotes virtually there hasn't been as much or or any travel happening i used to to just to travel a few times a month to go do these talks and now that that is on standby i do want to to spend a bit more time writing so that that is one of my objectives as well as uh, as doing more virtual keynotes i recently had had performed for a virtual event with the United Nations, which was really great. Wow! And I have a few, a, f- a few things coming up, uh, both for 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 speaking and for comedy. Awesome, awesome, man. Well, we I hope wait that to get to Canada and have yeah, a drink. we had a pl- we had a trip planned there. I know. In April, and that's obviously it all got really. Yeah, you know what? It was meant to be, Whistler. Jose, because we didn't know you yet, and now yeah. we do. And so <laughs> we wouldn't have caught up if and come and watch some of your comedy. So yeah, yeah, I would, I would offer that now when we come to Canada, we will have to catch up, and when you come to Australia, you have to come down under and come and do some yes. in Australia. 
Yes, that that had been that has also been on my mind, and hopefully in in twenty twenty one, air travel will 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 come back completely. So what I can hope and should 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 i mention my instagram handle or yeah, yeah absolutely we're going to put it all on on the thing but by all means mention where it now they, as well where did everybody find you? find you my instagram is at ye, yes way jose j-o-z-e which which obviously is the opposite of uh, uh, of No Way Jose. <laughs> and, and LinkedIn works too. I have LinkedIn as well. Yeah. With my, with my full name, Jose Perenian. Awesome, and guys, buddy. if you're listening to this and you're like, hang on, I missed it. We link all of where to find him. So he will put his website, his LinkedIn and his Instagram in the show notes. So also in the comment section of YouTube as well. Direct access, go straight there. Uh, and Jose, we'll end it here because I, we were laughing our heads off before we even begun and I forgot to preface it. So if you're watching this back on YouTube, yeah. Jose has his a sling type situation because <laughs> he hurt his shoulder. But what did you say to us? You said a great presenting to the hospital. <laughs> I said the the best time to have a stutter is when you are in the ER and they are and they are trying to assess the severity of each <laughs> case to see who goes first. Yeah. Whatever it is that I have my stutter will make it seem like it's so much worse. And, and the doctor did see me right away. Excellent. That's good news. Oh, that's, there you go. All right. We're going to leave it there. But Jose, thank you so much for just imparting that, those laughs, the truth, the advice, your message, and the message as well as, your story. Mm. I know this is going to have a great impact on so many. So thank you so much. And thank you, Anna. Uh, uh, and Morgan for for hosting me. It was the the entire hour went by so quickly as though we were just old mates catching up at a pub. So I I I truly enjoyed <clears throat> this chat. Awesome. Well, that will happen too soon, no doubt. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Bye. All right.